Hey y'all, welcome to the Coyote Traffic School Podcast. I am your host, Chris Pope, and the podcast, as always, is brought to you by Cots Pros Lures, the most trusted baits in trapping. If you need bait, lure, or any other trapping supplies getting ready for this upcoming season, uh, head on over to Cots Pros. Be sure if you talk to them or if you can leave a note when you put your order in online uh, that you heard about them through the Coyote Traffic School Podcast. That just helps them know that their advertising is working um and actually today's episode is with kyle cotts um and so uh, he said they are have been getting slammed with orders right now and getting some new customers through the podcast that's always easy uh, great to hear um but i thought it might be well before we get into that we're coming at you from the more like the leather working shed today Uh, i've got I've got some uh, wallets over here that I'm painting the edges on. I got some other ones here that I'm working on, and I just finished up one. It's actually for my sister, but uh, it, man, it turned out it's for my sister. She's giving it to her husband, but uh, it turned out I'm. It's probably one of the most proud wallets I've, I am of. It's a alligator, so the outside is alligator. And I told you, um, you know, I've been using the interiors from Springfield Leather Company. Well, I got this uh, Wicked and Craig leather. <clears throat> that I ordered f- from uh, Maker's Leather Supply in Texas. And it's pretty thin, and I got to thinking, I said, well, maybe I'll try making my own interiors, because there's just a little, a couple of things that, uh, those those interiors are, are great, they're quality interiors, but there's a couple of things that I, I thought maybe I, I would like to do differently. Um, and so I, I made up one here, and uh, man, it just turned out jam up. Uh, and so... Uh, I made up another one, and, and I had, I've got, so I've got a bunch of alligator hides from when I was trapping in Florida. Um, you know, I didn't, I didn't sell the hides. I just had them all tan, and I've been dragging them around with me. And so um, I've, I've got several that, um, that I had, and I pulled one out, and that, this, this piece just went perfect. The color went great with the, with the, the interior leather. And uh, so anyway, I'm, I'm working on a few of those. Um, I'm super, super excited about how that turned out. Um, but I'm working on some of the leather stuff to try to get ready for the Georgia Trappers Association Convention, which is when this podcast is published, it'll be the ne- the following weekend. So not the immediate weekend, but the following weekend. It's uh, September 18th, I think, in, um, in Dublin, Georgia. Uh, and so I'm going to be there. Uh, as long as nothing changes, which is rocking and rolling with uh, a bunch of my leather working stuff, I've got some of my fur stockings um, that I'll that I'll be there with, and I actually just got a, a fresh batch of uh, raccoons tanned in from Moyle that I sent, and I got these back in a month. I put in my online order with Moyle August third, and uh, so I think I can't remember if I got them shipped that day or I wound up shipping them the next day. But anyway, and I got them back. T- today is the tenth, and I would have got them back last Friday. So I would have got it would have been right out a month. Um, so man, I was in stunned. I've got I've got another um, set of furs with Moyle that I sent off in May, and I was like, that's surely what it is. It's some of my Texas cats and coyotes and all. And I opened it up, and man, it's all these raccoons. Which these were these were some of my nice bigger raccoons that I actually had stretched. And dried, and I actually put in the freezer to make sure that any bugs get to them, and they turned out great. I'm, I'm super. Uh, I, I get I get questions a pretty good bit, and you know I talked to uh, Bobby Dale Bulls about. I mean, you can see just the quality of the the, the interior of these raccoons, the the leather, how white that is, and I mean it's just soft, and and you see it just crumples in your hand. Um, is I get questions a lot about you know the high tanning formulas and, and tanning it home by yourself and you can do it there there ain't no doubt that you can do it and, and get a good quality product but man this is this was nineteen it was it was eighteen or nineteen bucks I mean it's well worth the money in my opinion for the product that you get back is uh, just jam up and I'm, I'm super excited to to work on some more projects with our fur and so I'm working on another interview um, that I think is gonna uh, shed a little bit more light on that and I, I'm just really excited about that so if y'all know of somebody that is doing some you know whatever it is utilizing fur if you are reach out to me I'd love to talk with you love maybe get you on a podcast because I think man I think that could be so huge for our industry it's showing people how 
we use the fur that we catch here and, and put it to use versus you know all our fur go in other places i've talked about that a lot but I, that's something that i've gotten more passionate about and i, I really um i think that's a great ending to the story that we tell um so anyway all that being said i, I reached out to kyle to see if we could talk with the trapping season coming up and who knows what fur prices are going to be like but um you know one thing that that is a pretty pretty constant and uh it's been a, a little bit almost out of hand so far as the the beaver uh caster market is glands right <clears throat> there's opportunity but there's so much variation um and you know you can you can google stuff and find stuff on trapper man that lists all kind of things um so i figured i would just go straight to the source and uh and talk with Kyle and actually he's got a couple of great resources so he's got uh, they, the Cosbros has got glands a trappers commodity a DVD that walks you through the the most common glands how to remove them how to store them so we touch on some of that stuff in the in the podcast but um, it's tough to get some of that stuff through audio and, and this just really shows you step by step um, how to do it and then he's also got they've also got a uh, skunks video uh, if you're catching many skunks uh, it, it's well worth learning the best way to optimize uh, optimize that catch. That's kind of what brought all you know. The, what kind of brought us on was uh, you know after my Texas trip last year, I had a boatload of skunk essence, and then I had a pretty good bit of a uh, beaver caster stored up, and so I shipped that to Kyle early in the year. Um, I guess it was right before COVID, um, and. Wound up actually through their through the points that they you you can get on their website for buying stuff. He just credited me um, the, the the value of my my essence and caster in points, and then I got my supplies, my baits, and things like that. It was like 250 bucks, um, you know, between my essence and uh, caster. So, uh, <clears throat> and I thought it would be worthwhile just to to get a better understanding get a good idea of how we can maximize our catch right because uh you know we're we're catching we're catching these animals we're skinning them and you know just a, a couple of quick and easy steps and we could potentially be adding i mean when you know he's talking about some of these the the glands they buy them by the gallon but you know anywhere from 75 to uh i can't remember which one he said now but you know two potentially 200 dollars a gallon um you know granted i mean some it takes a while to get a gallon but um you know, if you compare a couple of quarts of, of coyote and bobcat glands with, uh, you know, four or six or eight ounces of skunk essence and a pound or two of casters, I mean, you're starting to you're starting to talk about something that um, is definitely worthwhile, in my opinion, to to do for no more added effort than it is. So uh, we talk about we talk about the these two videos. Um, definitely a good reference, and then also at the end we kind of touch on. Um, making bait or lure yourself and they've also got a couple of good videos and that's something that's never never been very appealing to me to be 100% honest with you um, it's just a lot of it seems like a lot of work I, I think what, what throws me off more than anything is just the time of mixing all this stuff up and letting it taint for a year before I get to use it man I, I'm way on to so many other projects by then um, so anyway, but I know there's a lot of y'all out there, a lot of people out there that are interested. And I, I do think it would be really cool to come up with, you know, a, make your own lure and then use it to catch coyotes or something. I mean, that's, that's pretty cool. So, but we talked about that and you know, what, uh, how you could get started doing that, if that's something that interests you. And they've also got a couple of DVDs, uh, on that as well. So, um, there's in the lure room. Uh, lure and bait making with Kellen Cotts and then cracking the code DVD. So that, the the title doesn't really um, explain exactly what it is, but in the subtitle it's uh, in depth lure. Uh, let's see what it says. In depth lure and bait formulation. So uh, whether you're just wanting to kind of save up some glands as a byproduct and get some you know be able to cover all your bait and lure costs or whether you want to save up some glands and try to make them cots pros has got you covered uh, all the way around on that so anyway if y'all are anywhere near georgia i know there's a lot of conventions that are, are not being had this year um, so if you're anywhere near georgia and want to come swing by dublin and check out the convention uh, i'd be glad I, like i said i'll have a, a booth set up there come talk to me i'd love to 
love to talk to y'all and, and see you and put a face with a name. Um, and otherwise, hope y'all are happy, uh, trapping, staying safe, staying healthy, and getting ready because the trapping season's coming quick. We are here today with Kyle Cotts and uh, just wanted to talk a little bit about glands and uh, you know how we can how we can maximize our, our catch our fur catch as we all know with the uncertainty in the fur market and so um, Kyle you know you've got a couple of resources that are cover this really good and I don't want to uh, forsake those so the glands a trapper's commodity uh, DVD as well as skunks the best investment you'll ever make DVD and so I would encourage that's kind of where I, I bought both of those and and looked through those and kind of what encouraged me to, to talk with you about this but if you can just give us a, an overview of um, you know what maybe what species are most preferable and uh, just the general saving and storage of, of glands Sure. You know, first, you know, th thanks for having me, Chris. This is a kind of a kind of something that I think a, a, a lot of trappers overlook, and especially with the fur markets the way they are, there's a few different items that you know the the byproducts uh, of, of the glands are actually worth more than the fur themselves. Um, we I, I post I try to try to keep a uh, a gland a market uh, post on our website with the current current prices that we're paying and the different glands to save. Um, I haven't updated it since April because we're kind of kind of in the off season, and, and most of the glands have been. And most trappers have that collect glands or caster has sold them already. Um, but I'll be updating that as we get closer to trapping season, and we kind of know what our sales are and what our needs are, the different uh, the different items, and then I kind of determine pricing from there. Um, but if it sits right now, the the one I guess the, the good starting point would be beaver caster. Um, the beaver fur market currently is not the greatest, but caster is at you know basically generational highs, um, and it's a, it's a real easy gland to save. Very hard, very hard to tell as we talk about these different items. Um, it's a very visual thing, so it's hard to put in words where the glands are. So I'll kind of name them. Um, and you know, like you had mentioned, my glands DVD is a is a good resource. It's a cheap investment. Um, and I do kind of cover basically all the glands in there. Um, glands are very easy to save, but like I say, putting it into words over 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 the phone is very hard to explain to somebody. Um, but caster to start with is a very easy one to clean to uh, to collect. Um, basically, when you skin the, the beaver, the casters are sitting right there. They are surrounded by some fat, which they do need to be clean. Um, the fat. You want to remove the fat and the tissue around them. A little bit of a thin red membrane will dry, and that's not not critical. But um, the the uh, drying beaver caster is also something that, depending on where you live and what the humidity is like, uh, there, it's hard to say it needs to be dried for a certain set amount of days because uh, somebody in Georgia has a much higher humidity than somebody uh and in one of the more northern regions that's that's trapping beaver and, and trying to dry the casters in the winter time uh, in their first end. So, you know, to say there's a set amount of time, what I kind of tell people is they should be dried to the touch. Um, you know, a little bit of liquid is okay. Um, what I like to do is uh, lay them out on, you can lay them flat on wire and turn them every couple of days so that they dry. Or you can actually hang the casters over a wire or a string, and it's important to kind of turn them so that they don't, you know, the two, the two casters don't touch each other. Um, if they touch, you start to get mold and some issues there. So you want to make sure that the air can flow all the way around them. Blowing a fan on them never hurts either. Um, but uh, once they're fully dried, then you can. Uh, if it's going to be a while before you ship them to a lure maker or to one of the auction houses. I always tell people to go ahead and, and put them in the freezer once they're dried. Um, you know, as far as the caster market goes, um, you know, but like fur harvesters, I'd have to pull it up on their on their website, but they had a tremendous. The, the, I want to say they 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 had like the top grade caster was in the hundred plus dollar a pound range. Hmm. Um, but the one thing you got to keep in mind is if 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 you're a trapper and you're going to ship your caster to the auction, they will grade it out. 
Um, so not all of your casters are going to bring a hundred dollars a pound. You know, some of the shells, the, the casters that don't have a lot of uh, a lot of volume to them that are real thin, um, those are going to be shells, and they're they're not going to they're not going to sell for nearly as much. Whereas, like if you're selling it to us or to other uh, lure makers, you know, we're just pay- like last year we were paying um, as COVID hit in the spring, I, I, I dropped our caster price down because I was kind of scared, <laughs> as as were a lot of people. Yeah. Um, I wasn't sure what was going to transpire with the market. So so we were paying like, like $70, $75 a pound for it dried. I dropped it down to 55 And then uh, uh, in April, I stopped buying for this year because we had kind of filled up and, and You know, back in April, there was just so much, not that there's a whole lot, not that there a lot of certainty has come back to the world just yet, but but in April, I was really nervous as to what the fall was going to bring. It was so hard that I just didn't want to put any more money in Beaver Caster. Uh, But it is something that I'm sure this fall we'll be buying, and, and, you know, it's in these uncertain times, it's really hard to say what the market will do between now and when people start trapping again, but I would say we'll be close to that $75 a pound range again. Um, I, I, again, hard to really predict, but I, I would say that it's a, at this point, it's it seems the caster market is holding its own somewhere. Now, what is is the, the beaver, or the fur market, I guess, driving that escalation in caster price? Is it just kind of a supply and demand it's scenario? A, um, it's actually a perfume deal, um, and it's not actually, you know, the, the high-dollar casters that are, that are getting bought at fur harvesters are going overseas, and it's it's a it's a perfume deal. I also believe they use it in some different medicinals, um, supplements and stuff. I mean, I could be wrong on that, but, but the, you know, supply and demand is, is part of it, but I also think um, at a certain point, it's it's kind of deviated from supply and demand because the the the, the supply is is probably not real great right now. The demand is huge, but I also think that at a certain point, um, if there was a bigger supply, I could see a situation where a bigger supply, the price would stay the same, and then a bigger supply. And then the price would start to drop. And there's also the other side of the perspective is if somebody that uses beaver caster in a perfume, when you know, you're selling something to the general public, they, they can only scale that business so much uh, because they're relying on a product that is, you know, if you take beaver caster, the amount of beaver caster that produced in the world is very small when you would compare it to other perfume ingredients Say, for example, uh, they use glycerin as a base. You can buy tanker truckfuls of glycerin to use in perfume, whereas beaver caster as an ingredient is just not that readily available. So as some of them perfumers scale, I often question is there going to come a time where they say, we're just not going to use beaver caster anymore in our perfumes because we can't get enough of it to produce it at the levels we need. That's just my speculation. I'm kind of getting off topic, but... I, the beaver caster market makes me very nervous, and the reason I say that is I go back to the fall of 2007. I was at a convention in New York, and a guy came up. He had two five-gallon buckets full of beaver caster, and he had taken them around to other dealers, and I needed caster really bad at that point. And so I decided I'm going to flex my muscle, and I'm going to make him a super heavy offer and buy the caster. And that super heavy offer was eight dollars a pound. <laughs> <laughs> and and we had been buying caster three to five dollars, and that's what a lot of other dealers at that point were offering like five bucks. So when I came in at eight dollars, I was really like flexing my muscle because I needed it bad. And now you look at it at seventy five dollars a pound, and you know my how things have changed in thirteen years, and so. You know, when when COVID hit in the spring, I right away got to thinking about three to five dollar beaver caster again, <laughs> and so it made me nervous. The, the be, beaver caster price does seem to fluctuate because there's a market for outside of the trapping, uh, lure bait making fraternity, so to speak. Whereas, you know, 
cryo glands, fox glands, those other glands, it's all based on the supply uh, and the demand for entrapping lures, which is it's easier to get a grasp on. You know, I do business with a lot of other lure makers, and, and you know, we, we all trade things back and forth. And it's easier to have a handle on, you know, what what the needs are, what the supply is. Whereas, like I say, caster is kind of one to start with talking about beaver caster because it's the one byproduct that is uh, kind of more of an actual commodity than the rest because it is sold at the uh, at the auction. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. So, <clears throat> while we're talking about beaver, the other thing. Um, you know that you can save beaver oil sacks, and uh, they're they're right next to the casters. Uh, a lot of lure makers use them. Uh, they they're not nearly as valuable, but they're definitely worth saving. Um, we've paid anywhere from like I, I have it on our website currently at a dollar a pound fully dried, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it doesn't take a lot of oil sacks to get a, get to a pound either. Um, and, and that's just something that uh, we we have paid more in the past, um, and and probably will pay a little more for them uh, this winter, depending on how the fall sales go. Um, the beaver oil sacks, depending on who you're going to sell them to, I always kind of tell people that you know talk to the lure maker you plan to sell them to before you collect them, so you can do things the way they want them. For us, we like the oil sacks dried. Um, if we got to buy them green, we pay less. But there's some lure makers that actually want them green because that's how they use them in their lures. Um, so that's one important, important thing is, is, you know, talk before you really start saving the glands, talk to who you plan to sell them to and kind of get an idea as to exactly how they want them handled. Yeah, and that was a, a good point, you know, looking at the other species because you know, you, if you just Google, like, on Trapper Man, you know, coyote glands to save, you, know, you can get all kinds of different... Uh, opinions and ideas and and things that you should save and and as you pointed out in in the video you know everybody has their own uh what what they want mixed in with the gland so that's a that's a really important point of i think of of touching base with who you uh hope to sell glands to to make sure that you're getting what they're wanting right right and 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 that's it see the glands you know when we're talking about the gland the various glands and how different lure makers use them. I had a conversation with a customer yesterday, and I, I told him he was. We were talking about aged meats, but that's the same with the with the glands. You know, making lures and baits. It's like everybody's grandma makes chocolate chip cookies, and your grandma made them different than my grandma, but they tasted great. And ultimately. It's kind of the same with, with lures and baits and, and when we're talking about glands. I I know a lot of different lure makers. I know a lot of different ways of handling glands and, and aging them. And ultimately, the end product is going to work the same. It's just a different process to get there. So you want to make sure that, that you're producing a product that fits into that lure maker's process is, is, is kind of important, I guess. Right. So, with the uh, got the beaver out of the way, um, kind of talk about coyote glands, red fox glands, bobcat glands, gray fox glands. We group all four of them together um, initially because those four animals were saving the anal glands, the hot glands, which are the hot glands are a small little bean-sized gland in the rear leg basically when you make the opening cut to skin any of those animals a lot of times you'll cut in that crease of muscle and there'll be a little like pocket of fat that will have that gland in it um we we also like the urine bladder in the glands um the sex organs the testicles um the the whole female reproductive tract can go in to for our needs um the penis bones I don't like them in the glands. They just plug up our grinder for the most part. And ultimately, you can sell the penis bones. That's a whole other market. So don't put them in a gland. Sell them to Skulls Unlimited or another company that buys buys bones. <laughs> um, and then, then the, the neck glands, which the neck glands, again, real hard to explain. They're kind of uh, located, oh, about halfway between. 
kind of in front of the shoulder is the best way to describe it, and you can pinch the muscle, and you make a little cut, and then there's a pocket of fat, and the, the neck glands are fairly large. Uh, they're, they're about three or four times the size of the hot glands, um, and it, they, they range in size, you know, the, the neck glands, depending on the health of the, the animal, they seem to swell at times. But um, it's a hard thing over the phone. I, I do a better job in my, my glands DVD of showing that neck gland. Uh, but, but all those glands can be the anal glands, hot glands, urine bladder, the sex organs, and the neck glands can all be put in one container. Of course, you've got to keep coyote glands, fox glands, bobcat, gray fox, keep all the species separate. But all the different glands can get frozen together. And I always tell people it's best to freeze them fresh. That way... You know, some lure makers are are using them. You know, they're they're grinding them and preserving them fresh. Other lure makers are letting them rot for years before they use them. Um, so, to to uh, to produce a product that's easier to sell to the various lure makers, it's best to just freeze them fresh. Um, and then, while we're talking about freezing things, a lot of a lot of trappers will take a gallon, old gallon milk jug and they'll put glands in it. They'll skin a couple coyotes today, and they put the thing in the freezer, and then tomorrow they skin three more coyotes, and they put the glands in, put it back in the freezer. Well, when you're doing that, there's a lot of air in the container. So it's best to get an idea of how much you actually have. You know, glands will, will weigh roughly nine pounds per gallon. Um, or after a week or so when the container gets full, set it out, let it completely thaw. And you'll see that you have a, you know, you you maybe had the gallon filled, and then once you let it thaw, it goes down to where it's only half full. So that's one thing that's important. Um, you know, if, if, if we measure the glands when they're thawed, um, or or by weight, that's the most accurate way of of doing it. Gotcha. As far as prices go, of those those four different. Um, Bobcat glands always seem to be uh, kind of the, the higher priced item, mainly because there's not as many bobcats produced as there are the other the other uh, predators. Um, I have it on our website now at $125 a gallon for bobcat glands, and I have I I, I would say that that I, when I update that we will actually be closer to 200 maybe even $225 a gallon this fall um, as bobcat. I, that's one item I know we're probably going to need, um, and like I say, production is everything. I, there's just not as many bobcats produced as there are, say, coyotes, um, because first off, bobcats don't don't live everywhere in the country. And a lot of states have limits on how many you can harvest, whereas coyotes live everywhere. And there's also a lot of people that hunt coyotes, so the production is a lot higher to where coyote glands, we were buying so dang many coyote glands last winter um, that by the time March rolled around and there's a lot of nervousness in the world, um, we I had lowered my price from $100 a gallon to $80 a gallon, and we were still buying coyote glands every single day, it seemed like, at $80 a gallon. Um, so with that being said, coyote glands, are definitely worth saving, but I think they're going to be a little less valuable uh, this year, just because it does seem like there's a, a great abundance of them in, in the in the industry now. Um, gray fox glands, kind of like bobcat glands, there's not a real lot of them produced. However, they're not used as much by lure makers as coyote, red fox, and bobcat. So that kind of makes the gray fox glands. I have they generally. Uh, are like eighty to a hundred dollars a gallon. I had them at eighty dollars a gallon on our website currently, but I probably will increase things a little bit this fall um, here in another couple months when I have a better idea of how much we've used up. Um, and then lastly, the red fox glands are kind of something that's always in demand. Um, red fox glands. You can also use ranch red fox glands, which there's um, some of them being produced. And then wild red fox. You know, there's. There's just not as many fox in the country as there used to be. So, you know, you're looking at the mid-Atlantic states and then portions of the west, um, and there's, there's pockets of red fox in the in places in the Midwest. But, but 
the quantity of red fox glands never seems to quite meet the demand. Um, I had them. I was paying 150 or 200 dollars a gallon last winter. I forget where I was. I lowered that to 120 in March, just again being cautious. But I do foresee that being being higher again uh, uh, this fall. So I got two questions around around that. So far as the quantities, uh, I mean, do you only want gallon? Will you buy a quart? You know, uh, how how does that? Good good question. We we'll buy. I generally tell people, um, you know, we'll buy any quantity. Where it comes in, you know, if you get too small of a quantity, the cost of shipping it to us doesn't offset the the volume. Right. Um, so if you know. Quarts are great. There's there's no problem. You know, a lot of times you can you can put a quart of grant glands frozen in a bag and ship it in a in a flat rate box through the mail for you know Illinois centrally located. So there's not a lot of freight attached to that. And, and we generally pay the freight for excuse me for any any glands we buy. I always offer to pay the freight. Um, so it depends on the item, but for the most part, you know if and also, you know, if somebody has a pint of coyote glands, four ounce bottle of bobcat glands, five pounds of cast, caster, and four ounces of skunk essence, you know, there's enough there to make a decent box that's well worth the freight. So we don't mind buying the small little quantity of bobcat glands and the pint of coyote glands because we've got enough other stuff there. Right. So, you know, there, it, it's it's always what I tell people to is if you're, say, say you only catch a couple coyotes a year or you catch 10 coyotes a year, the glands, we're going to rot them down anyhow, so it's fine to keep them in your freezer from one year to na- the next until you build up enough of, of a quantity there. Um, that's that's not a problem at all. Um, a little bit of freezer burn even on glands for our purposes makes no difference. Um, you know, as long as, as long as they're not too dry, um, it, you know, keeping them in, in the freezer for or, or for until the next year or even three years as long as you don't have as long as the freeze doesn't defrost and refreeze too much you're you're you should have no problem you know saving them up over the course of a few seasons gotcha and that was my other question is it you know is it okay to leave them in the freezer and, and accumulate some enough to enough to be able to send so yeah yeah sure absolutely there's no problem with that gotcha all right yeah so, and then uh, moving on from the the predator glands, we could talk about uh, uh, the the weasel family, which would be uh, badger, otter, and mink are the three main main ones. Um, Fisher, marten, wolverine, some of those glands, there is a very very limited market for them. But I'm going to kind of skip over them because those three we don't even buy. Um, but I do know there are lure makers that have an interest in them, especially the Fisher glands. Um, weasel glands too. There is a market for them, but but they're a limited thing. Um, and again, to produce a volume of weasel glands, weasels are weasel glands are very very small. So I mean, it takes many hundreds of weasels to make a decent quantity. Um, so we we'll kind of we we'll just those animals. I kind of say they're they're worth saving. Um, you know, that's something though. You know, check around. Uh, like some of them glands we would maybe be interested in buying um, or I could point you to another lure maker that might be interested if you if somebody has a quantity of them price I'm not really going to speculate on those because I, I, I just don't know <laughs> they're kind of oddballs right. um, but with, with the, the ones that I'm more familiar with would be well we'll talk about badger and otter glands and mink glands um, mink glands the bulk of the mink glands used in the trapping business are all from rich mink um so wild mink glands are definitely worth saving again it takes a from unless you live in a place like minnesota where you can catch five or six hundred mink it's really hard to build up a quantity of, of you know for a trapper to produce a gallon of mink glands you got to live in a in you know nor in parts of Iowa or, or Minnesota where there's a tremendous mink population. Um, we, we mink glands generally are per, fairly valuable. Again, it takes a lot of mink to make that amount of glands, and it seems like the demand is always there. The supply is kind of low, 
um, from the standpoint that over the past decade or even longer, most mink ranchers went to an automated skinning system. So with the skinning machine, the the the, the knife that is actually a disc that spins, and when it makes the opening cut, it uh, it cuts through the gland. So that affected the amount of mink glands because a lot of mink ranchers didn't want to save them. Everything was automated. So now it's down to mink ranchers that still skin by hand will save glands because they're valuable. Or you have this select group of really high rolling mink trappers that actually produce enough. Um, so that seems to be, mink glands always seem to be about the highest price gland there is. And the only gland you're saving is the anal gland, which there's two little pods on either side of the anus. Um, they're real hard, again, hard to explain in words, but very easy to save. Um, very easy to show you uh, how to save them too. <clears throat> Otter and badger glands, the same way. You're only saving the, the anal glands. Uh, there's two pods on each side of the anus. And um, otter, otter, otter glands and badger glands both kind of limited. Um, it seems like there's always a bigger supply of them than there's a demand. Um, I don't. It, it it seems like every time I I clean out the freezer, I always get to the bottom and there's just a few gallons of otter glands that I didn't really know I had because I never <laughs> needed them. <laughs> so so uh, you know they're they're probably around you know, 75 to $80 a gallon on those two. They're just not hugely val valuable. Um, but definitely worth saving. Again, I like to say, I mean, there's, there's, there's any, you know, even if you're not catching a lot of otter or badgers, it doesn't take up much space in the freezer. Right. Um, you can save them from one year to the next. Um, the other thing would be muskrat glands. And muskrat glands are found on uh, male muskrats in the spring, which limits it because there's only a lot of states don't have muskrat season ends in January or February before the glands are really swelled up enough to save them. So that is sometimes limits the, the availability of muskrat glands. Um, so muskrat glands, again, the, the mid-Atlantic uh, states that have a spring season there's a lot of muskrat glands pr produced there on the east coast um, also states like South Dakota that have a spring season and a lot of muskrats uh, Wisconsin also has some big marshes with a spring season so that, those are the areas where the, where the muskrat glands are really produced um, the price on muskrat glands is oh, for whatever reason the other glands we send, tend to set up by the gallon with muskrats it always seems to be by the cork because again it takes a lot of muskrats to to make a cork um so we last year i was paying like 75 dollars a cork um they have been as high as a hundred dollars a cork but recently I, I think the demand has dropped off to where the price has come down a little bit um we also run into in situation and this applies to all the glands but i can think of an instance with muskrat glands where you have a smaller lure maker that needs like two quarts and they need them bad and they're willing to pay a hundred dollars whereas there's larger lure makers and not to toot my own horn but we would maybe buy m many multiple big shipment of muskrat glands and we'll pay $75. So is the market really $100 a quart just because somebody bought two quarts, whereas there was 100 other quarts sold and they only bought $75? Right. So that's where, you know, I, I sometimes have trappers say, oh, you're too cheap. And when they, you know, they'll call and ask them about grants, I'm like, well, look, here's the deal. You know, sure, that, you know, you saw on, on a trapping forum where that particular lure maker would pay that price. But you know what? They bought two quarts in their fold. They won't buy any more at that price. So that's not really where the market is. Um, and for whatever reason, muskrat glands seem to be uh, one of those items that there's there's always a demand and the supply is not quite there. However, um, it does seem that the, over the past year, the supply has, has grown. I don't think that price is as high as it was a year or two ago. Um, but again, that's a limited thing. Like I say, there's, you know, a, a trap.
Clapper in Illinois or Georgia isn't going to say muskrat glands because, well, first off, like I'm sure Georgia, <laughs> there's not a lot of muskrat glands and not a lot of muskrats to just run out and trap hundreds of them. No. And Illinois is the same way. I mean, we have muskrats on, on some of the bigger river systems and, and some of the certain marshes, but our season ends before the glands are really, really swelled up to save. Um, so that's, that's, you know that's one item that's like I say it's tough because you got first off you got to have muskrats which is rare in most areas of the country and second of all you got to be able to trap them in the spring. Um, so the last item on the list is skunk essence, which seems to uh, seems to be the one item that we buy the most of. It's very easy to save. Um, with a syringe, a lot of trappers, you know, some people that don't even want skin skunks can still save the essence because you can carry a bottle and a syringe with you in your truck and save it as you catch them. However, I would advise people to skin their skunks. That's the one one item that it does seem like skunk skunks always sell regardless of the market. They're more of a novelty and, you know, you can always make money selling stretch and dried skunks. Um, so skunk essence very easy to save with a syringe. Um, again, hard to tell you exactly where to stick the needle, but it's very easy to show somebody. Um, again, they're a member of the Weasel family, the glands set on each side of the, the anus. Um, what I generally like to do is I make the opening cuts on the skunk, and then I cut the glands off the skunk and set them aside um, so that when I'm skinning the skunk, it, you know, if you're pulling the tail especially, Sometimes your hands slip, and you put you put a little pressure on them glands, and then you're essentially squeezing the essence out of the skunk. So for me, I like to make the opening cuts real gentle, and cut the glands and the anus off the skunk and set them aside. That way, you're not really losing any more essence. Sometimes, you know, you will have some essence leak out uh, after this after you harvest the skunk, but but. Uh, it's best to try to try to keep as much as you can in the glands because it's easier to save. And there's also a myth: just because a skunk sprays, it doesn't mean it won't have any essence in it. Um, when skunks spray, they don't totally empty their glands. It's possible they would, but uh, don't don't say, "Oh, there's no essence because that skunk sprayed." That's not necessarily true. You have to keep in mind too. Sometimes you catch a skunk in a coyote set. It sprays, and then six hours later, you're there. So in six hours, you know, there's probably essence in the glands again. So, you know, don't – It's a, to me, when i dealing with skunks, I always treat every skunk the same. I make the opening cuts. I save the glands. And, I, and sometimes, too, you look at it, and it's like, oh, there's not much essence there. Uh, but you stick the needle in, and you, and you get half a cc out of, out of that skunk, which isn't a lot, but it all adds up. Right. Um, so, so that's what I say. Always, always try to collect the essence because more than likely there's some in there. And you know, if you're if you're skinning the skunk anyhow, it only takes a second to to get the essence out. Um, storing skunk essence, it always needs to be in a glass bottle, and it should be a bottle with a metal lid. A plastic lid or um, lids that have rubber seals like a mason jar, the skunk essence will melt that. It basically eats the rubber, eats the plastic. So it's best to avoid those type of containers. Um, using like an actual lure bottle um, with a metal lid is best. Um, over time, skunk essence will rust the metal lid and eat through it, but it takes time, a lot of time for that to actually happen, whereas plastic or lids with with rubber it doesn't take very long and, and it starts to eat at that it's a definitely a very a very toxic uh liquid um so the skunk essence price we were at like 18 dollars an ounce which i think is kind of middle of the road um price wise maybe may, actually i shouldn't say middle of the road probably on the high end um because we were we were needing it um I do know there's, again, like I used the example of some smaller lure makers will at times drive that price up. Um, I was told of one lure maker that was paying $25 an ounce last, uh, last season. However, you had to take that, you had to take that and trade. That was not a cash price. Whereas, you know, $18 an ounce, we, I send you a check for that. Um, so that, you know, you want to talk to who you're going to sell it for to up front because let's say, you know, you're going to, 
say you produce 10 ounces of skunk essence and you're thinking 250 bucks, and then they say, well, you got to take that and trade. You may not need $250 of your supplies at that point. Right. Um, so talk, you know, talk to who you plan to sell. Um, I'd also like skunk essence. Um, some guys or, or some fur buyers that produce a big amount, like I put on our website, will pay a premium for 32 ounces or more. Um, just from the standpoint of shipping, too, with us paying the shipping, shipping depending on where you're, where you're at, um, 32 ounces, shipping 32 ounces of skunk only costs about a dollar more than if you shipped us 10 ounces. So, you know, that I'm willing, with that freight savings, I'm willing to kind of pass that along to the producer a little bit and, and give them a little better price for the essence because it's not costing us as much in shipping to get it here. Right. <clears throat> but that would basically cover the, uh, the main glands and castor. I guess we could touch on, you know, some, some animals too, the carcasses. Yeah. Um, Bob, bobcat carcasses, muskrats, beavers, skunks, they all have, have value. Um, bobcats, it seems like there's always a market for them. Like we'll, we'll buy bobcats, muskrats, beaver. We prefer them gutted and frozen fresh. Um, there's something though that can't be shipped really. Um, so that's, it's, it's kind of more of a localized thing unless, you know, somebody was producing enough that, uh, like, this for beaver or muskrats it wouldn't work because they're just not that valuable and we always seem to get enough of them but like bobcat carcasses if somebody was producing enough that they could freeze them in empty barrels and put them on a pallet um, then then they could probably be shipped to us that way um, but there's not a huge value there like muskrats we buy a lot of them by the pound um, I put it on a website like basically again local trappers or, or or people that could deliver them to us, like 25 cents each on muskrat, 50 cents each on beaver, which isn't a lot at all, but it's something. Um, bobcats would be like $5 each, which, you know, if you caught 100 bobcats or or had 100 bobcats and could get them to us, you know, hey, that's 500 bucks, that's a lot of trap line gas. Skunks, last year we were paying $1.50 a carcass, but I, that's something, I don't know that I'm even going to buy skunks uh, this coming skunk carcasses this year, um, just because we've kind of accumulated a lot of it, so it always kind of kind of fluctuates. But again, if you if you know a lure maker, especially if if you know you live in uh, uh, you know you may live a long ways away from us, but you may live in Minnesota where you know uh, Tim Cave and Minnesota Trapline Products would would be interested in buying carcasses carcasses. Um, and there's there's a lot of other um, lure makers across the country that always need different meats that you know you could potentially find a market for them. Yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm. Well, and like you said, with the the bobcats, you know, if you can, a lot of times you get five bucks for a skull. You save the glands, the hide, and the and the carcass. I mean, it all it all works together. You you're, you're producing exactly. that stuff anyway, so. Right, right. Yep. So another question that I have is, is, and it's not something that's ever really interested me because it's so easy to to order some evanescence or something from you, but what what would you say somebody that's interested in kind of tinkering with making their own lures, you know, what's a what's a minimum quantity of, of some of these glands if you want to make a, a bobcat? lure or something like that you know what's a minimum quantity that you might need to be able to even get started well to get started honestly one set one animal um you know you can you can you can uh you can steal the blender out of the kitchen (laughs) uh you wouldn't even need a grinder necessarily (laughs) you know take a sharp knife and slice them glands up so that they're not real stringy and you know you can start blending stuff together with with basically you know, no quantity, uh, or, you know, very, very limited. Um, if you just want to, tink, you know, to tinker around, that's how I think, uh, you know, Kellen and I started. We were, you know, using the caster off the beaver we caught, and we weren't touching a whole lot of beaver, but it's a starting point. You know, when you get to doing it on a large kind of commercial scale, where, like, we're selling, you know, that's a big part of our business, you know, then we're, it, it, it's kind of sitting here now, 
when I look back to when I first started, it's kind of funny to, it, like, I could have never imagined we would need the quantities of some of these different clients that we need today when I was starting out. Like, I, it just was unfathomable. Hmm. Um, so it's, it's kind of amazing how, you know, over time things scale and grow. But, you know, if you're just starting out and you're interested in it, you'll need a large quantity. Catch one bobcat, save the glands, maybe, uh, you know, throw, throw the liver in with the glands, blend it all together. Hey, you got a great start of a bobcat base there. The liver is not a gland, but it, it does add volume there um, to give you a little more quantity. Um, you could put the gallbladder in there. Uh, even it, it, there's, It's just limitless. Like I, I used the grandma's cookie example, you know, all the time we have people ask us, what's the best way? How do I need to do this? And I have a hard time answering the question because there is no right and wrong or wrong way to make lure. There is a right and wrong way of preserving things. But after that, the sky's the limit. Um, and by what I mean by that is preserving things, regardless of how you're going to make lure bait, all the lure makers in the industry make things different. But the one thing everybody can agree on is things have to be preserved because otherwise they're going to be blown up out of the jar and you can't have that. I mean, no trapper wants to be carrying around a lure in their bag that at any time just explodes and leaks rottenness all over. <laughs> so, right. you know, to, to present, prevent that, you know, salt and sodium benzoate are the two main preservatives used in the industry. Um, salt would be used more like for preserving the meat, ground fish, stuff like that. Um, Salt works good in meat glands too, but like the uh, the the coyote fox bobcat glands, even beaver caster, uh, sodium benzoate, and roughly a cup per gallon. Uh, that's kind of a whole other subject. But would, whatever whatever you're experimenting with, you know, if if you can you can preserve like we'll use coyote examples. You coyote glands is an example. You could preserve them fresh, or you could leave them sit for a year to taint before you preserve them. But at some point in the process, you need to preserve them so that they're not going to keep building up gas, so that they'll stay in the jar you put them in. Um, so, well, you know, that's that would be the key. Is is you know you can you can start off with very small quantities, and I'd, I'd suggest you do. Um, that's that's the best. Um, best way to gain experience and knowledge about something is start off with what you have to work with. As long as you get it preserved at some point, sky's the limit. Use your imagination and ultimately pay attention to what the animals are telling you. Um, you know, I had a conversation with a guy the other day and he said, you know, the coyotes are walking by my sets. And then they got to tell, tell me that he was actually, uh, he was doing nuisance work in, I believe, in Alabama if I remember right, in the summer. So a summertime coyote in Alabama is interested in a whole different thing than a winter coyote is in January. Um, from the, So, you know, you kind of got to look at the animal and, and what they're doing and also realize that what works at a certain time of the year may not work later on because the animal's in a different mindset. And ultimately, what I tell people, lure and bait, glands, it's all fascinating. But not to talk myself out of business, but at the end of the day, to be really successful on the trap line, a great trapper can take the worst lure on the market and be hugely successful. Hmm. A, trapper that, a trapper that doesn't have a lot of experience and doesn't necessarily understand their equipment or the animals yet, you can give that trapper the best lure, and they're probably going to be unsuccessful. So it's good lures and baits are, are helpful, but ultimately understanding the animals and, and, and understanding your equipment and location, there's so much more that really goes into it. I don't, I don't want, to, I want, to, want to, you know, give the impression. I don't want people to think, Hey, you gotta if you if you don't age your coyote glands a certain way, you're not gonna catch coyotes. It's just simply not true. Um, it's just you know, there's there's great value and good attractants, but it's not the end game to success. Yeah, and I think that's a man, that's a great I think that's a great spot to end, is that you know, there's a lot of people that you see they 
they're they're always looking, thinking that there's some secret that they're you know they they haven't been told yet that there's some mm-hmm. magic lure or magic bait, and that's all they need. But it's a uh, and it's just it's just the uh, the learning curve that you gotta you gotta get over and get through to to putting in the work and and learning the animal and and their habits is that's the that's the key to it all. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And I mean patience. Patience is a huge part of it because it's like. Just like any, I mean, not just trapping any anything. You know, before we got on the podcast, we were talking about finance and investing a little bit. And you know, if you're patient, um, you come out so much further ahead in almost anything. Um, and no, that's not always true. I mean, there's certain times you got to cut your losses. And and you know, speaking about lures, I mean, we had lures that just simply didn't didn't really work out the way we wanted, so we just stopped. You know, we didn't didn't try to research or plan. It just wasn't. It's not going to work. Um, from the standpoint of one, it maybe it just isn't as attractive to the animals as we thought it was, or two, there's an ingredient in that formula that's just hard to get or way too expensive. So we're, we cut our losses. We're not going to make that anymore. And that's that's kind of so true of, of really anything is just you know not not trying to rush into things and just let let it unfold and and uh, a lot of times being patient. You just you start to gain a lot of knowledge uh, if you just kind of let things unfold. Good, uh, good words of wisdom there. Well, Kyle, you got anything else that you want to, to share before we sign off? And uh, and we'll, we'll no, I just up. I just like to thank thank you and all the listeners for all the support and the orders they give us. You know, we really appreciate. You know, uh, happy to sponsor you and tell everybody to smash that like button for you or if they're in the south mash down on it till it turns blue <laughs> <laughs> well that sounds good i appreciate you taking the time and we do appreciate the support and that's what I've, I've tried to tell everybody is if they're if they're coming to you and, and putting in a new order to let you know where they heard from you about so just so uh, it, the word's getting around so that's good to hear yep yeah well thanks a bunch for having me chris and you know thank i greatly appreciate all the orders people give us All right, well, we'll do it again soon. Sounds good. Thanks, Chris.